dear beloved members in Christ who have been baptized into the body of our risen Lord, baptized into his death, baptized into his resurrection, baptized into his hope, and recipients of forgiveness of sins in his name. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. There are a series of monumental passages in the Acts of the Apostles set forth by Luke the physician. No greater one could be than Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then there is the great passage that we have in the Pentecost account, Acts 2, 38 and 39, where Peter proclaims, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will receive forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. And that promises to you and your children and all whom the Lord our God has called by the gospel from afar. Then there is a scandal of particularity passage from Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other name in the universe than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, given among men by which we must be saved. And then, in Acts chapter 10, Luke puts together the Old and New Testament in these words, to him, all the prophets, to Jesus, all the prophets proclaim, to Christ the Messiah, every single prophet proclaims that whoever believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. Now we have another monumental passage. But this one people tend to slip by, rarely quote, and yet it's one that we should pause and reflect on a great deal. Acts 11, verse 18. When they heard these things about that revelation that Peter had, that Gentiles were now part of the kingdom of God, everybody fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Now to the Gentiles God also has granted repentance that leads to life. See what's happening there? Even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance. And it is God, above all, who is the author of repentance in our life. Yes, repentance is something that we do. But above all, above all, above all, it is the kindness of God in Jesus Christ that moves you and me to make that good, gracious, wonderful U-turn. So often when people talk about repentance, you almost forget the idea that it's something I gotta do, it's something I have to do. But that is secondary. It is important, but it is secondary. What is primary is the work of the Spirit and the Gospel and the goodness of God and the kindness of Christ and the forgiveness that He brings that moves us to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Repentance is that wonderful U-turn that turns away from the dominion of the devil, from the dominion of darkness, from the dominion of sin, to the love of God, and the grace of God, and the mercy of God rooted in His dear Son. It is that glorious U-turn. <coughs> Throughout the book of Acts, there is seemingly an ongoing debate that is taking place. Luke is telling story after story after story that God does not play favorites. That Jesus Christ died for every single human being that ever lived in this world. And that God so loved the world. Now this is something that you and I take for granted, but it was not something that most of the people in Jesus' day in Judah and Israel believed. They thought that God chose the Jewish people, but that his scope of salvation was not all mankind. The story in Acts, however, shows that God is concerned about every single individual on the face of this planet. In Acts, shortly before Jesus ascended to fill all things, in Acts 1 verse 18, Jesus told his disciples, But you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit who will come upon you. And you, the 
disciples, you will be my eyewitnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and you will take the gospel to the remotest parts of this world. It will go out for all people. It was kind of a hard sell at that point there. The disciples weren't really getting it yet at that point. They didn't even get it at Pentecost there. They were still asking the question, Jesus, when are you going to return and establish the kingdom like it was in the good old days in Solomon and the good old days in King David? And Jesus just ignored that question and said, hey, I have bigger plans. I want to establish a kingdom, not just for you, but for all people, and one that will be the longest lasting kingdom in time and space and will last forever and ever and ever toward a new heaven and a new earth. He had much bigger plans than what they were thinking about. He told them, think world, don't get narrow. Think globally, don't get turned inward. Think of all nations, not just Israel. By nature, we want to operate with conditional love, but God's love is unconditional love. And so Jesus stretches them a little more, and a little more, and a little more, before finally the light bulb will go on. But it was a difficult sell at this point, even after the resurrection. But Luke was laying a foundation. I think when you read the Acts of the Apostles, you almost have to have in mind Luke's Gospel before. And that's about 28% of the New Testament. In Luke's Gospel, already you've got this wonderful genealogy where Luke takes them all the way back to Adam and Eve. And already he's beating the drum. God so loved the world. Jesus' very first sermon that he proclaimed in his own hometown in the sermon, shortly after, he speaks about how Elijah and Elisha had gone up into Gentile territory and two Gentile women had embraced the gospel of God. And the people got so angry when Jesus said that Gentile people embraced the word of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, that they went after Jesus and tried to drive him over the cliff and murder him after his very first inaugural sermon there. And in Luke's Gospel, you find that this is a common thread there. When Jesus is carrying the cross and he stumbles and he can no longer carry it, it's a black man from Simon of Cyrene from Northern Africa who carries that cross. And Luke is setting this up to show that God so loved Gentiles and Jews. And who is it that is standing at the foot of the cross and proclaims that this man who died on the cross was an innocent man, but it was a Roman centurion, another Gentile. And then Jesus told them, and the women remembered it better than the men, that after Jesus rose, they were to go to Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. So Luke is setting the table all the way through. Now Peter has this vision from Jesus it's a green light for them to eat red meat, at least more red meat. And now what takes place there is a mini Pentecost experience. And so you got the big Pentecost experience where people come from all these different nations. And then you got a second and a third and a fourth Pentecost experience. And finally the light goes on. Finally, after that vision, Peter begins to see that God's hope of salvation is all mankind. They realize also that God is the primary actor in turning us to faith. God granted the Gentiles repentance. It was there already in the Old Testament. Turn me, O Lord, turn me, and I will be turned toward your pardoning love. It was already there all over the place, but somehow they had missed it and dismissed it. But now Peter realizes that God is the primary actor in grace with repentance. And to be sure, we are in, with, and under, and involved in that process, and daily repentance is so vital, so important. But where do we get the power to daily repent and turn toward the great love of God except from His love? St. Paul, Luke's dear friend, has this beautiful passage in Romans 2, 4, where he says, it's the kindness of God that turns our hearts home. It's the kindness of God in Christ that moves us to repent. It's the kindness of God that enables us to see reality as it is. 
whether Jesus' death on the cross, whether Christ pouring out his blood, taking the form of a lowly slave for us, all the kind things that God does, especially with the message of Christ's death on the cross, that is the power. Those are the pistons. That is the pneuma, which is the word for spirit, uh, for us to live a new life as new creations in Christ. Finally, it comes down to this. God's kindness uh, moves away human blindness. God's kindness in Christ moves us to walk also in kindness. We love because God first loved us. We are kind because God was kind in Christ for you and me. So the key for having power to be kind to one another, and kindness basically is the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you, comes from the kindness of God in Jesus Christ. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, constantly forgiving one another, even as God, for Jesus' sake, there's the power, the kindness of God in Christ. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding may guard and keep your hearts and minds in the kindness of Christ now and forever.